Hi, my name's Mike. You may be wondering why my name isn't more flashy like Axe or Bull. Well, that's because this is the real world, not the movies. I work for Guardian, and you're about to see a video on kiss training. Now I know this is going to disappoint some of you, but I'm not going to be showing you how to tongue your lover. KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. And it represents getting back to the basics of firefighting. This is the mission of Guardian. A return to perfecting many of the techniques that have been proven to work throughout the generations. Safeguarding them for future firefighters. Some of the things that you're going to see in our videos are probably not what you were taught in the academy or read in a textbook. And now you're probably saying to yourself, why should I try these techniques then? Well, the answer to that is simple. Because they're effing awesome. Besides, how could our salty old timers be wrong? Listen, our academies and textbooks teach us many general practices, but common sense isn't one of them. Now, if you're the type of firefighter that needs a safe space or thinks that we should have layers of bubble wrap around us before doing our jobs, then these videos probably aren't for you. So do us all a favor and click that little X in the upper right hand corner of your screen now. For those of you who still possess some mental toughness and grit, stay with us. We know that firefighting is an environmental emergency. Yes, fire hurts the environment, but that's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about specific jurisdictional demands. For example, firefighting in a small town rural Montana isn't the same as a big city like Boston. They are completely different environments and have different methods and techniques of doing their jobs. The point being, you can never learn enough or train enough in our profession. If the day ever comes when you think that you've learned it all, that's the day you should retire. Or hey, become a chief. I'm obviously joking. Many of us would love to wear that white helmet one day. Regardless, I hope you stay with us for our videos. But for now, let's stop in to Station Hero and see what's going on around the firehouse today. This is perfect. This is exactly how I saw it on the internet. Dude, this is so convenient. What in the hell are you guys doing out here, man? It's a ladder carry we saw on the internet. You can carry everything at once. This is awesome. Are you kidding me? This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen, man. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Where are you going? This is perfect. Look at it. Apparently, we just saw what these clowns do to carry their ladders. Let's go check out what they're doing now. Greg, what in the world you got this guy doing, man? We're practicing climbing ladders, the proper way to carry all your stuff. Charge my line! You guys are the dumbest firemen I've ever seen. If this is the type of ladder training you're doing at your firehouse, you need to stop immediately. Come with us to the training grounds and let's get back to basics on ground ladder training. Ground ladders are one of the most vital operations on the fire ground and the most criticized. This is because they are the most visible operation that occurs upon arrival. They get performed, and yes, I'm saying performed, because you have an audience of other crews and bystanders. It doesn't matter how great you look pulling up in your shiny truck. The next few minutes of you getting out and running to the back and throwing your ground ladders is going to tell everyone whether you're a fireman or a clown in a costume. Before you throw ground ladders and throw them correctly, you need to understand the reason why we do it. Not only do we throw them for the safety and survival of trapped victims, but also for your safety and survival of you and your crew. Many times we see ladders thrown incorrectly. They're either too short or too tall, there's not enough covering all the windows, or the exposures aren't even met. And many times we see them laying in the front yard or along the sidewalks. Preparation for your plan for ladders begins while you're en route to the firebox. You should be going down the road listening to the dispatch on the radio for cues of what could be going on whether there's someone trapped or whether they have an idea of the structure that's on fire. You should also be formulating a plan for the deployment of ladders with your partner in the back. If dispatch can cue you on what type of structure that's on fire, then you can devise a plan with your partner right away of which ladders you're going to deploy, whether it's going to be a 35 or whether both of you can carry single ladders like the 24 and the 16. This is another reason that we can't stress enough to be familiar with your area. This will also help you formulate that ladder plan before that air brake gets pulled upon arrival. We showed you what you should be doing if you're a professional on the way to a firebox. Unfortunately, far too often, you end up seeing this. 
We got one, brother. We got one, baby. Oh! Yeah! You hear that, boys? Let's go get him. You hear that, Let's boys? Go get him, brother. We got one. Woo! Listen, we have to slow down. Act like a professional. When the garbage man turns a corner and sees trash on the side of the road, he doesn't get excited about it. There's a reason that they called you, and it's probably because their house is on fire. So you shouldn't be getting overly excited either. If that was how it looked in the back of your truck while you're on the way to a firebox, you're missing golden opportunities to listen to dispatch cues and to formulate a plan with your crew in the back about how you're going to deploy ladders. When you jump out of the truck, your eyes should be on the prize. You're scanning and sizing up the scene. So what is it that we're looking for? We're looking at the building. We're looking at location. We're sizing it up. We're looking at fire conditions. We're also looking if there's possible victims. And we're scanning to make sure that there's no overhead hazards or ground hazards. Remember that everything is happening really fast. Make sure that you're moving smooth and your movements are deliberate. All too often, guys are hurrying to get out of the truck, and they begin to look like the Three Stooges. A good rule of thumb to remember when you're exiting the truck on the fire ground is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. As elementary as this may sound, practicing getting out of the rig with all your gear on is worth doing. It decreases your chances of tripping, falling, or injuring yourself. When you're exiting the truck and meeting your partner at the rear, if at all possible, make sure that you have your ceiling hook first, and any other tool that you might need. If your hand tools aren't stored near the cab of the truck, make sure you remove them from the rear prior to pulling off that large ladder. If you're vertically challenged like I am, and especially if your ladders are stored up high, you're gonna need to hold on to your hook while you're beginning your pull. This is a good example of how working with someone of a different height makes it a little more difficult. Because I'm short and Greg's tall, plus our ladder is stored pretty high, I had to carry it on my shoulder initially before I could get my arm through it. What you see now is an example of a two-man high-low carry. Obviously, I'm the low man. Greg's the high man, he's got the ladder on his shoulder. That way, when we get to the building that we're choosing, upon our approach, it's very easy for me to go ahead and place the ladder, spot it, and Greg can begin his raise almost immediately. Due to the height of the storage compartment of the ladder on our truck, you'll notice that I had to carry my hook initially. But once I was able to get my arms through the rungs, I can easily place my hook along the rail of the ladder. That makes it easier for me to carry. Had our ladder bed been shorter, or have I been taller, I would have been able to pull this ladder out initially and put my arm right through the rung and rest the hook right away. When you're removing your ladders, make sure that you choose your largest ladder first. Most of the time, if you're using a 35 or more, you're gonna need at least two people to carry this ladder. We always wanna choose that large ladder first, especially if you need a partner, because if you come back to get it later, chances are there's not gonna be anyone back here at the rear of the truck to help you. Keep the phrase in mind, large ladder before the scatter. We say this because Upon arrival at the fire ground, especially if you're on a truck company, your guys have a lot of independent jobs they need to do. So they're going to be going their own directions. Take advantage of having everyone together upon arrival and get that large ladder off and up. Gray's going to show us how to remove a 24-foot ladder by himself. First thing he's going to do, if he hasn't already, is find his tool of choice, which is the ceiling hook. After he has the ceiling hook, he's gonna begin pulling the 24 foot ladder out. You'll notice that this ladder is stored pretty high in this truck. So Gray's gonna pull it out and use the back of the ladder in the truck as a fulcrum. Now, from this position, Gray can find his balance point. The balance point is crucial when you're doing a single man carry. Notice that our balance point on this ladder is clearly marked. It's used re using re red reflective tape. That way it's easy to find at night. If you don't find your balance point when you're pulling out a 24 foot ladder or even a 16 foot extension, you're gonna to begin to look like a clown as you try to march off because you're gonna have the front dive into the ground or you're gonna lose it in the rear and it could knock you over or cause injury. Just to review, 
When you come to the rear of the truck to start removing your ladders, make sure that you're taking the largest ladder off first that you're going to need. This might require you to have a partner. Make sure that you're working together and communicating. That way you don't drop the ladder or injure one another. If you plan on removing a ladder by yourself, whether it's a 24 footer or 16 foot extension, make sure that you have already marked your balance point on the ladder and try to use reflective tape. That way at nighttime, you'll be able to see it. Remember, if you don't have that balance point marked so it's easy to find, it could really cause you trouble when you pull that ladder off. Before you pull your ladder off, make sure you have the proper tools. You should already have those before you begin that pull so it's easy to rest them on the rails of your ladder. You don't want to be that guy that carries his ladder to the front of the building and then realizes that he didn't bring his tools with him. Now you have to waste time and run back and gather your tools. Something else that you never want to overlook is clearly marking your ladders in the ladder bed. Obviously you can see the one and six on this. We want to make sure that we mark all of our ladders with the appropriate numbers. This is going to make it much less confusing for your truck guys to find whether it's in the middle of the night or whether they're in a hurry. Before you start humping these ladders to the building, there's a couple things you need to look for. One being any ground obstructions. Ground obstructions are going to impede your progress, so you need to make sure that you have a nice clear path on the approach. Ground obstructions can include bushes, fences, even fish ponds, and they exist in the front yards because I've fallen into one myself. The other thing you need to be aware of is overhead obstructions. And overhead obstructions also include trees, branches, electrical wires, or even TV cable wires. The most crucial thing that you're going to need to be looking for upon your approach is victims either hanging out the windows or signaling from inside. You need to put all of your efforts into getting that ladder to those individuals first and foremost. While you're scanning for victims in the windows, you also need to be targeting the windows that you're going to choose for the particular ladder you have. Obviously, if there is a front door and you only have two sets of windows wide, you need to make sure that your 35 foot ladder is being thrown to the windows above the front door. The reason you're gonna throw the 35 in front of the front door if you only have a structure with two windows wide is that you wanna create a nice buffer between the front door and the ladder so that your crews can operate when entering and exiting the structure. The longer the ladder you're using, the more of a buffer you're going to create between the wall and the butt of your ladder. The 35 foot ladder gives you approximately a 10 foot buffer. This is going to give you adequate space for our crews to be operating both engine and truck guys entering and leaving the building. It also allows for the hose to be able to be stretched without entangling the ladder or minimizing the entanglement. If the building you're throwing ladders to is more than three windows wide, or at the bare minimum three windows wide, then the 35 foot ladder shouldn't go in front of the front door. It can be put to either of the other windows, depending on any obstructions that might be in place. What you see behind me is a good example of a building that's two windows wide. We're obviously going to take our 35 and place it in front of the front door. That way we create that large buffer so that crews can enter and exit safely. This is a good example of the buffer provided by a 35 foot ladder. It's approximately 10 feet. If you were to mistakenly throw a 24 foot in front of that front door, your ladder would probably set up almost exactly where I'm standing. This 10 foot gap allows for us to have our hose line stretch and not get entangled with the ladder or our crews that could be going in or exiting the building in case of a, an emergency. It's vital that you secure your halyard, especially when you're using a 35 in front of the front door or an entryway. The halyard is going to create trip hazards and it also will create a hazard for anyone that's climbing the ladder. If an engine company or if the hose line gets entangled in this halyard, not only could it knock you off the ladder, but it could knock the ladder down onto your crews operating underneath. You can secure your halyard by tying off a simple clove hitch knot and make sure that the slack remaining on the ground gets kicked underneath the ladder so that any of your engine crews or other truck guys entering the building don't trip over it. This is an example of what you don't want to see. This is pure laziness. It's a result of guys just throwing a ladder haphazardly and then rushing inside or rushing off to perform some other task. This is going to set the engine crew up and anyone that's climbing this ladder for pure disaster. If your halyard is left unsecured, it's very common for the engine company to take it with them as they're stretching their line inside the building. 
Also, other members of the crews walking by can easily get their foot tangled up in your halyard. And by doing this, it's going to pull anyone that's on the ladder off of it when the ladder falls. There are numerous techniques for approaching with a 35-foot ladder. Although one thing that is a constant is that carrying the 35 with two people is a team concept. Both parties involved are scanning for different things while walking towards the fire building. In the approach we're about to show you, you're going to see a two-person high-low ladder carry with a 35-foot ladder. The guy in the front is considered the low. It's low because the ladder is resting on his shoulder, the top rail is. His arm is through the rungs. Our lead man, or the guy in the front, has a very specific job. He is looking for the target spot where he wants to rest the ladder in order for the raise to begin. While he's doing this, he's also scanning the ground and scanning any overhead obstructions that could imp impede the progress of the approach. The crew member in the rear has an important function, and that is to be scanning the building to make sure that there are no overhead obstructions or if there are possible victims hanging out of the windows. This is a good example of a two-person high-low carry with a 35-foot ladder. Your lead man is scanning the ground for any type of ground obstructions, and he's also looking for his target to place the ladder. Your second is carrying the ladder on his shoulders, scanning the windows, and preparing to raise. The lead man has the important job of spotting the ladder. His targeting of where he's going to set it down is crucial to the rest of the evolution of throwing this ladder. It can either go real bad from here or work out perfectly when they start to raise it. Your lead man wants to make sure that he rests the foot of the ladder right to the outside of the window. And he also needs to make sure that there is adequate space between the building and the ladder. A good marker for this is using your ceiling hook, tossing it down like you're going to anyway, and making sure that that is a good distance between the ladder and the building itself. The two most common mistakes that your lead man makes is not stopping directly underneath the outside of the window and not providing an adequate gap between the building and where the ladder is going to be placed. Your six foot hook gives you ample space in order to make your adjustments as necessary or to move the ladder away once you raise it. If you make any of these two mistakes, you're going to cause serious problems for you and for your partner. Once you go to throw the ladder, you're going to realize that it doesn't line up with the window. And then you both are going to look like a couple of clowns trying to dance around with your ladder once it's already raised. Not only does this make you look bad and look like amateurs, but if there's someone trapped inside, you're chewing up valuable time and not being able to get to that person. Okay, you just saw an approach using the 35-foot ladder with a two-man high-low carry. Now we're going to show you the 24-foot approach using a single-man carry with Greg on the balance point of the 24-foot ladder. When you're doing a single carry with a 24-foot ladder, your man has much more responsibility than what the two-man carry had with a 35. He's scanning and spotting all at the same time. He's looking to make sure that there's nothing hanging out of the windows or no victims trapped, and he's also watching for any type of ground obstructions that might impede his approach. At the same time, he's looking for that perfect target point and keeping his eye on the window that he plans on throwing the ladder to. We never want to line ourselves up with any ground floor windows because they can be deceiving and throw off exactly where the second floor window could possibly be. You can see Greg approach using the perfect balance point in the middle of the ladder. He throws his hook down to create that space needed if necessary. At the same time, the ladder is between him and the building. So if something happens and any objects fall out of the window, he's able to drop that ladder and get out of the way. Once he lines it up, he's prepared to do a raise using the rails. When you approach the building with a 24, the reason you keep it between yourself and the building is for easy egress if something goes wrong. You can also carry your tool in one hand because you should be able to manage the 24 with just your arm and shoulder. If you don't want to, you can put it on top. This might help if you do have to bail on the ladder for some reason. So if I'm approaching and perhaps an air conditioner unit starts to fall out of the window, I can easily drop my ladder and get out of the way. The reason you can't focus on this bottom window when you're doing the single man approach is because it could be out of alignment with the second floor window. Here's an example.
once I extend this ladder, it's not going to be of any service to me or anyone that could be inside in order for them to get out. This is exactly the reason that as you're approaching the building, your eyes should be on the prize. And if it's a 24 foot ladder, you should be looking at the second floor window. After you've practiced getting your approach down pat, it's time to get these bad boys raised and thrown. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a two person raise with the 35. We're gonna do a beam raise because it's the most popular and most common. After the lead man has spotted and put the ladder on target to raise, our second in line is gonna to prepare to raise that ladder. He already has it on his shoulder from the approach. So now he's gonna get ready to put it over his head and slowly walk down the beam. The lead man is gonna make sure that it's stabilized and is assisting as the beams are being, uh, being brought closer to him, he's pulling on them to relieve any type of stress that our razor is having. Once we have the ladder in a ready to raise position, take note of the body mechanics of our lower halves. Our opposite legs are supporting the ladder using the instep of our feet all the way up to our knees. This eliminates the ability for the ladder to dance on us and shift and get away. Also take note of the center of gravity that we have. Our bodies are low, our knees have a slight bend, and our opposite leg is behind us to offer additional support on both sides of the ladder. One of the biggest mistakes somebody can make when throwing the 35 foot ladder while stabilizing it is not supporting the beam as much as possible. A lot of times you'll see people use just their toes to support this ladder. The 35 foot ladder is extremely heavy. And if it's windy or if there's any other interference, it can easily get away from you. Notice the difference in support just using your toes versus coming back to your instep and all the way up to your knee. Much less wiggle room and less chance for a disaster. Once you have the ladder ready to raise and nice and stabilized, the spotter needs to take one more quick look to make sure that you are directly underneath the window where you need to be. So I would glance up and make sure that my ladder is going to be dropping in to the window I'm choosing. Once we're ready to do that, I'll give the signal and the razor will begin to raise this ladder. But I need to make sure that I have both my hands securely on the beams of the lower fly before that raise begins. This is pertinent that you do this or else you're gonna lose fingers and break your hands. As we get ready to raise the ladder, we make sure that both men are securely attached to it and stabilizing it properly. Once we start raising it, the spotter needs to make sure that his hands are not on the fly section in order to offer additional support. Let's go ahead and start. As the ladder's going up, the spotter needs to be looking to make sure that it's gonna hit the target. Always maintaining contact with the ladder. Okay. Once the spotter gives the command for the ladder to stop, we're going to drop it in that window and try to hit our aiming point. Ready to drop it? Do it. The spotter gives the command to stop and drops the ladder in so that the tips hit the bottom quarter of the window or the middle of the lower pane. The reason for this is we want to go ahead and get an initial break on that glass before we move the ladder out to ready it to climb. So we have it dropped in perfect. It lined right up with the middle of that bottom pane and now we're going to move it out to prepare to climb. The easiest way to slide a ladder back is for both people to be on each beam. This allows the most stability. So we're both going to grab the second rung, keep our hands up on the fourth and slide it out. And both looking and watching and making sure that the tips fall right on the sill. Another method that a lot of departments use is making sure that the tips of the ladders are visible inside the window. The main reason this is done is for interior crews searching or looking for a window to bail out of. It makes it very easy for them to find the window that has the ladder in it. If you're choosing to use this method as some departments do, it's critical that the tips are the only thing showing in the window. You don't want to have three rungs blasting through, impeding your ability to come in or to leave in a hurry. One con with having the tips in the window is that if you are bailing out or trying to get a victim out through down the ladder, 
it is easy to knock this ladder over because the tips will obstruct your exit. Once you have the ladder raised and suited for climbing, there's one last step that you gotta make sure you take care of, and that's getting that halyard tied off. You don't want anyone tripping over the line or getting their hose tangled up in your halyard, possibly pulling you down off the ladder or pulling the ladder down on top of your cruise. Greg's gonna show you a single man raise of the 24 foot ladder. We're only gonna use the 24 foot ladder for our examples because the 16 is just too light. If you can't carry and throw a 24 foot ladder by yourself, then you don't belong in the fire service. If that offends you, then there's another reason that you don't belong in the fire service. Greg's gonna show you a couple different techniques. We're gonna take you through some of the basic ones. These aren't all of them, but they're the ones most used when we're approaching a building. Greg's target's gonna be the same as with a 35 foot ladder. What I mean by that is he's aiming to get the tips of the ladder into the lower pane, the middle of the lower pane. Go ahead, Greg. From Greg's positioning of the tip of the ladder, as he moves it back to get a good climbing angle, he can hopefully drop it in enough to break the, at least the lower pane of the window. Greg's gonna show you a couple techniques with getting this 24 foot ladder raised. You can see that he's supporting the ladder using his knee and the instep of his right foot. He's got both of those on the base section of the ladder. He also has additional support with his left hand on the halyard and his right hand on the second rung. Both of his hands are gonna work simultaneously in raising this ladder. He's gonna pull down on that halyard and raise up with his right hand on that rung to get the ladder into position. Once he's got it locked in, he's gonna come around to the front of the ladder, still supporting it with both hands, and then get ready to drop it into that window. Another method you can use to raise this, if the conditions allow, is by just raising the fly section. This only works well if the base of your ladder is already resting on the structure and you don't have to extend the ladder too high. So Greg's gonna show you by grasping both of the rails of the fly section, he's gonna go ahead and raise the ladder up a couple rungs. This was a very easy method to do considering that he had the support of the structure itself. Now he's in position, he can just move it away from the building and get ready to climb. The last method that Greg's gonna show you is the method of rolling the ladder once it's already raised. We're only showing this to you as an example of what you shouldn't be doing. The reason being is that you're consuming a lot of time and it's very dangerous because you're very likely to lose control of the ladder. You'll notice that the fly section is closest to the structure. Greg's gonna raise it to his desired height. Once he has it locked in, he's then going to move the ladder out and away before he begins to roll. It might take one or two rotations in order for the ladder to end up in the exact spot it needs to be. Just to reiterate, we don't like this method. It's very easy to lose control of the ladder. Plus, it's extremely time consuming when you're trying to roll a ladder multiple times to get it in the correct position to climb. People use the technique of rolling because it requires less strength and body mechanics. If this is you, then it's time to train harder. If you can't get the strength in order to do this on your own, then it's time to either hit the gym or find a new career choice. One of the last things we need to look for when we get done raising our 24 foot ladder or our 16 is to make sure that our halyard is tied off. One of the common mistakes when throwing your 24 foot ladder is realizing that once you have the ladder in place and you're raising it, is your fly section is actually inward towards the building. A lot of times we feel the need to pull that ladder out and readjust it and dance with it in order to have that fly section facing you. There are a lot of departments that actually throw their ground ladders with the fly section towards the building. It doesn't negate the ladder's ability enough for it to warrant any type of major concern. Before you utilize your ladders by throwing the fly section in, make sure that you know your ladders 
you know the manufacturer and you know the restrictions that might apply to your ground ladders. Some of the things you need to be concerned with are the manufacturer's recommendations and the specifications for your ground ladders. Some ladders are incapable of being climbed and used with the fly section inward. Make sure that you know your specific ladders on your rig. Another common mistake that's made on the fire ground in the single person ladder throw is realizing that once you have your ladder in place and you start to raise it, it's upside down and the tips are actually in the ground. This creates a fiasco on the fire ground because now you have to lower it and drop it and then re-raise it correctly. There are a couple things that you can do to make sure that you raise that ground ladder the way it's meant to be raised. One of those is to make sure that your tips are painted. You can also put reflective tape on the end of them. Before Greg gets ready to climb the ladder, he's got to do a couple last minute checks. Some of those checks are making sure it's at the proper climbing angle, checking the grading of the ground to make sure that it, the, the base of the ladder is stable. Greg also needs to make sure that he has his mask on if he hadn't already done so. It's always beneficial that if you're carrying tools up a ladder or you intend to enter, that you also plug in first before doing it on top of the ladder. Greg's checking his climbing angle. Appropriate climbing angle is you standing on the bottom rung with your arms extended almost forming an approximate 90 degree angle at your armpits. If Greg has a bad climbing angle, this is more what you're going to see. He's not able to extend his arms and form that 90 degree angle in the armpit. This is a very dangerous climbing angle because it's very steep. This is another example of a terrible climbing angle. In this one, the ladder is way too far away from the building, which is promoting a terrible climbing angle for Greg. The chances of this ladder kicking out and Greg dropping are increased drastically. If Greg's unsure of his climbing angle and just for pure safety purposes, the last thing he wants to do is make sure that he has somebody butting his ladder. When someone's butting a ladder, the best technique to use is standing behind the person climbing with your feet firmly against the base of the ladder. As Greg begins to ascend the ladder, I'm going to go from just supporting it with one foot and bring my other foot in as well. I got my hands firmly placed on the beams of the ladder and my feet down on the base. This is another method of butting a ladder and a poor one at best. Reason being is that I'm focusing all my strength up top on the ladder instead of down at the base. So as Greg's climbing, I'm pulling against the ladder, but it takes me out of the area of being able to see what's occurring. I have terrible situational awareness right here. Okay, Greg's going to show us how to climb a ladder using a tool. He's already done all his checks. He's checked for his climbing angle and he's also checked for the gr gr any grading issues with the ground. Before he climbs, he plugs in. That way, when he gets to the top, he doesn't have to juggle his tool and his SCBA. Okay, Greg's gonna start climbing the ladder. As he climbs, take note that he's holding on to both the rails and he's sliding his tool up the rail at the same time. He's also keeping his body away from the rungs. That way it limits any type of entanglement problems with his SCBA. Take a look at where Greg stopped while he was climbing the 35. There's a reason for this. Greg's tall, but he also has a six foot hook. We're going to use all six foot of that hook in order to bust our window out to ventilate. Reason being is that we don't want our head in the window when we break that window. You have no idea what's trapped behind that window. Superheated gases, flames, but you'll find out real quick once you bust it. You need to have your upper torso out of line of sight of that window. Although you have to envision it because this is a burn building, Greg is gonna take his hook and come down on that window sash or that middle crossbar. This, will, this should effectively knock out the entire window and enable him to either pull it out or push it in. If you're climbing with more than one tool, Find a way in your training to make sure that you marry up your tools so that you don't attempt to use both hands. Climbing with a tool in each hand is an unsafe practice. It takes away your ability to be stable on a ladder. Plus, if you reach your desired climbing height and then realize that you haven't plugged up yet, you then have to juggle your tools in order to put your SCBA on. Even with climbing with a single tool, can also be dangerous, especially if you're not hugging that rail with that tool. Riding the rail with your tool in hand provides more stability for the climber. 
If the tool is haphazardly dangling around, not only does it throw your balance off, but can endanger people below if you should drop the tool. If you're holding the tool and the rail at the same time while climbing, and you accidentally drop it or let go, there's a high percentage that the tool is going to fall somewhere close to the vicinity of the base of the ladder, and maybe even ride the rail down without getting too tangled up. However, if you're dangling the tool around while climbing and you drop it, there's a chance that it's going to land quite a few feet away from the ladder and maybe on somebody's head. We talked earlier about how we frown upon rolling ladders. That only pertains to your initial approach and deployment of a ground ladder. There is a time and place to roll your ladders. In the event of an unforeseen emergency, such as a firefighter needing to bail out of an adjacent window, or a firefighter finding a trapped victim in an adjacent window that is not laddered, you're going to need to roll. The reason that we're going to roll an existing ladder to a window that does not have one is because it's much faster to do that than it is to try to deploy another ground ladder from a truck or one that might be laying on the grass out front of the structure. The reason that we choose the action of actually rolling this ladder instead of picking it up and carrying it over to the adjacent window is because we run the risk of, if we carry it, of dropping it or becoming unstable and us having to dance with it before we can get it in place. This needs to be done in a very timely fashion and we can't afford any mistakes. We're going to simulate the technique of rolling a ladder if we are rolling it for the purpose of an emergency on a window that doesn't have one. The first thing we're going to need to do is to make sure that our halyard was tied properly onto the rungs. We don't want a lazy halyard that gets tangled up as we roll. The next thing we need to do before we actually start the process of rolling is make sure that we are not going to come into contact with any overhead obstructions, such as awnings over windows or even a porch roof over the window you're trying to get to. Okay, we're going to begin rolling the ladder, but we're going to keep it in front of us at all times. We don't want to lose control of this ladder. So we make sure we're going rail over rail, all the way down to our window in a controlled motion. Once we've reached our window, we put it in place quickly and we're ready for the emergency. Your body mechanics and your body positioning are key when rolling a ladder. Many times people use the wrong form and that's when things go bad. Before you roll, you want to make sure that your feet are shoulder width apart at the bare minimum. You also want to make sure that you are not right up on the rails. Keep a nice distance away and keep a slight bend in your knees. This gives you a nice low center of gravity so that you can control the ladder as you roll it. So as I begin to roll the ladder, it's right in front of me and I'm going to keep it there at all times. So I start to roll and while I'm rolling, my feet are sliding. I'm not crossing my feet at any time. That would cause me to trip. So I continue to roll, keeping the ladder directly in front of me and my feet sliding until I reach my desired target. If I'm a little off with my spotting, I can quickly put it right back into service. There are a couple common things that go wrong when you're rolling ladders. One being that you're not keeping your body in a good position to control the ladder, in which case the ladder starts to get squirrely and dance away from you. Two not securing your halyard. By not doing so, you start to entangle yourself or the halyard underneath the ladder. If this happens and you need to readjust, it's going to be near impossible for you to do so without pulling the ladder back away from the building and getting some help so that you can pick the ladder up and untangle that halyard. Even with perfect form, when going to roll a ladder, things can go wrong because of the rate at which we're trying to do it. Our initial response to any emergency is to do it as fast as possible. However, when you're rolling a ladder, especially a 35, by doing so in such an expedient manner, it's easy for this ladder to dance out of control and fall. There are a couple ways to improve your ladder training. One is to make sure that you prepare for this, anything unexpected that may happen when deploying your ladders. Some of those things are, of course, overhead hazards and ground hazards. We're going to touch on them real quick so that you can see some of the different things that may happen with your ladders while you're attempting to deploy them. One of the hazards we encounter are wires close to the building. In our training ground, we don't have them here, but we have to pretend as if we do. When we do this, the ladder gets deployed and the approach is completely different, bringing the tips in to the building first. 
Craig and I are going to demonstrate how to use a two-person carry to bringing a ladder in close to the building to avoid any wires that may be there. As we approach the building, we're coming in tip first. As I get close, within my six-foot range, I'm going to go ahead and get the ladder ready for a flat raise. Once I have it up, I'm going to put it over my head, and then we're going to slowly walk it up. That way we're avoiding any overhang wires that there may be. From this position, the ladder can be raised just as it would have been in a normal carry. This technique of raising a ladder with the idea that there are wires close to the building is ideal for the 24 foot ladder, but it's imperative to use with a 35 foot ladder. After bringing the ladder to the building, Greg can show us now exactly how to raise it with a single person with the idea in mind that there are wires still hanging above us. The first thing he's gonna do is bend, bend down and reach the tips. Then he's gonna get underneath of it on the base section and walk it down. Once he has it in this position, it's no different than deploying a ladder in the normal fashion. Another way you can improve your capabilities with the ladders is to do the waltz with them, or what we call dancing with ladders. It's best to have a partner with this and use the 35, but for the sake of what we're gonna show you, we're gonna use the 24. The dance with your ladder is gonna begin with you and your partner in the exact same position that you would be if you were beginning to raise the ladder. On every rotation of the dance, you're gonna reinitiate your stabilization techniques. This training technique is bound to improve your stability and your strength when using any of the extension ladders. However, it is best suited for using that 35, which is notorious for getting squirrely every time we're trying to raise it. There are numerous techniques for learning how to throw ladders. Today we only showed you a few, we showed you the basics. We also showed you the most common ones used. It's important that you practice all the techniques mainly to find the ones that work best for you. An important key in finding which ladders are gonna work best is also for you to be familiar with your area. Firefighting is environmental. It's dictated by the areas that we serve. Find out what ladders are commonly used on fire grounds that you're going to and perfect the techniques with those ladders. Another thing you need to do be to become proficient at throwing ladders is to make sure you're in shape. Remember that 35 foot ladders are heavy. 24 foot ladders are approximately 75 pounds. So keep that in mind when you're training or you're trying to do any type of ladder function. When you're doing ladder training, it's important to make sure that you're wearing full gear. I know that we weren't for some of this video and that's okay because we're not doing this to train. We're doing this to show you some of the proper techniques that you can use. The reason that you wanna train with full PPE on is because that's what you're gonna be doing when the time comes to do it in real life. You have to make sure that you can do all these techniques while in full SCBA and full gear and under the restraints of different environmental issues that you might encounter. You know that the majority of our structural fires occur between midnight and 6 a.m. So if you're gonna do ladder training, it might be a good idea to start doing some of it at nighttime so that you can see what difficulties occur when you have limited vision. There's a lot of training videos on the internet that show people playing dodgeball, or playing soccer using their SCBAs and breathing on air. If you really wanna test out your ability to conserve air, practice doing it while throwing ladders. There's no reason for you to train on playing dodgeball or soccer. You're not gonna be doing that on the fire ground. If you wanna conserve air, do it training with the tools that you're gonna be using in real life. The art of throwing ladders is all about repetition. Reps, reps, reps is what you need to do. You need to be doing it in the rain, the snow, in the sunshine. You need to be doing it at night and you need to be doing it when you're tired and fatigued because that's when the real emergencies are gonna occur. All fire departments have ladders. Whether you're on an engine or on a truck, you can train with ladders. Even if you don't have a place to actually throw them at your firehouse, you can remove them from the truck or the engine 
and you can take them outside, stabilize them and raise them, put them down, carry them, and drag them. All these are effective means of training with ladders. And this is one of the few things you can do without any expense or the need for any specialized or burn training center. Throwing ladders is becoming a lost art in the fire department. That's only because firemen are becoming more and more lazy and doing less training. We need to get back to the basics. And what we saw today were some of the very basic techniques that you can use when deploying your ground ladders. These techniques have been used for generations and they're the foundation by which we build off of when we're using our ground ladders. You have to master these basics before you can start imp implementing any type of flashy technique that you might find anywhere else on the internet. We want to give a shout out to the Westchester Training Center in Pennsylvania. And by no way do the things that we taught you today reflect their beliefs or techniques. But we teach these techniques because we use them every day and they work well. Thank you for joining us. And if you like what you saw, then check us out on the web. To all you Facebook firemen, let the trolling begin. And I want to say thank you for your service. But to all you real firemen, keep it simple. And we're going to be cliche and say, see you on the big one.